So, greetings everyone. Welcome to another session of Enough under the series Tech Opportunities Decoded. In today's session, we will be learning how to win knowledge economy. Today, we have with us the eminent physicist Dr. Raj Gopala Chidambaram, who is renowned for his integral role in India's nuclear weapon programs. He was deeply involved in the Pokhran test and supervised. India's nuclear weapon test. He has been awarded the Padma Shri and Padma Vibhushan for his contribution to the success of the nuclear test. He has previously served as the principal scientific advisor to the government of India and is currently BAE Humi Baba Professor at BARC and an AICTE Distinguished Chair Professor. The first half today's session is the presentation by our speaker, followed by interactive Q&A session. So feel free to post your question in the live chat. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Now let's get started. The audience is yours. Hello, can I start talking now? Yes, sir, Hello. you can start. <laughs> because I'm not able to see you. Yes. Of course, you are you able to see the, see the screen? No, sir. Screen not see. is not visible now. The... <clears throat> now? Yes, sir. You... It is visible. Are you able to see me? No. Yes, sir, I am able to see you. Oh, okay, but I'm not able to see you. Maybe later we can we can have it. Okay. Uh, members of the faculty of Indira Gandhi Delhi Technical University for Women, Preeti Shubham, and other organizers of Innov, and my young friends. It's a pleasure to be with you here today and I thank Preeti Shubham for the invitation. You are a relatively young university, but as your Honorable Vice Chancellor says in your web website, uh, that it has IGD TUW is now an icon for women empowerment. You have a wide range of activities. You have a center. You have a center for sustainable development. And I'm glad to see that you hold international conferences in frontier areas in science and technology. For example, the one on artificial intelligence in November, November this year, artificial intelligence and speech technology. I am also very happy to see that your university has been conferred the award of the LEAD Institute for E-Learning Excellence for Academic Digitization by QSI Quag and that your university won the second rank in women colleges and universities category at ARIA 2020. ARIA is the utter ranking of institutions for innovation achievements. 
Taking all this into account, I have chosen the topic of today's talk on how India is, should become a knowledge economy. Knowledge economy, not just a developed country, but a knowledge economy. With the ability to generate new knowledge, with the ability to appropriate knowledge generated in other countries. That's what they, that's what already developed countries are, are doing. Very often what's happening in India is we generate the knowledge and they, they take advantage of the value that comes from that uh, knowledge. You know, this is the year of the Amrit uh, Mahotsa celebrating 75 years of India's uh, independence. The government has declared uh, uh, this year as the Amrit Mahotsa year. And I was uh, mentioning in one of my talks on the achievements in Indian science and technology that the foundation for India's achievements after independence was actually laid by the great scientists who worked before the, before independence, large number of them, Satyendranath Bho, Jagdish Chandra Bho, C. V. Raman, P. C. Mahalanobe, Moksha Gondam Vishweshwaraya, who is, uh, was the greatest civil engineer India has produced and his birthday is celebrated as engineers, engineers day. But Bhaba, Hone Bhaba, the founder of the Indian Atomic Energy Program, started his work before independence. He laid the foundation for that by starting the Tata Institute of Fundamental, Fundamental Research. That is why, you know, how did, what motivated those great people to achieve world class science? Say we Raman for instance. In fact, uh, there is Chandrasekhar also was a great uh, astrophysicist, but a nephew of C. V. Raman, but most of his work was done in the University of Chicago. In his biography written by Kameshwar Wali, Wali asked Chandrasekhar, how did India produce world-class scientists like C. V. Raman and S. N. Bose in the 1920s? And Chandrasekhar replies, in the 20s, there was need for self-expression as a part of the national movement to show the West that in their own realm we were equal to them. You know, we missed uh, several centuries of the uh, because of colonization and uh, development of science had gone down, but then it Renaissance started in the in the first half of the last uh, the last century. Sommerfeld, the great man in quantum mechanics, he commented on C. V. Raman after he announced the discovery of the Raman effect that India had suddenly emerged in competitive research as an equal partner with the European and American sisters. You know, there are stories of Raman. There's a story of Raman receiving the Nobel Prize from King Gustav, Stockholm. And when he took the prize and came back, that he saw that he had been sitting under the Union Jack. That is when Raman says, then I realized my poor country does not even have a flag. And Raman was a very strong, a strong person. He broke down when he went back to sit in the chair, of course he was dressed like an Indian, South India, under the Union plan. Today, the young people like you, the motivation should be to India, a developed country and a knowledge economy. So, we talk about the science, technology, innovation ecosystem. What are the components of an excellent ecosystem in this context? for a knowledge economy. Talented young people like you, you, it is your responsibility to maximize your talent. Of course, your teachers will also help you, your parents will help you. 
and there are the gifted. Then there are gifted. Gifted is different from bright. Bright can understand anything. You tell him or her. But the gifted think differently. When I was a PSA, Prangul Scientific Advisor, we had started a program under Jyoti Sharma. She is a mathematics professor. On how to identify the University of Delhi, how to identify and nurture gifted children. We need high quality faculty and of course money, strong infrastructure. And then you need an appetite for risk taking. If you want to go higher, you must have this I'll come back to you later. If you want to develop industry and you want strong academy industry interactions. India's technology needs range from nuclear and space to rural and you must have a strong rural technology development and delivery program. You must have international collaboration. We can't lock ourselves out today. But it must be used to leverage our own initiatives. And then we want leaders. Without leaders you can't achieve much. And of course, when I talk of an R&D ecosystem, it must obviously be different from national lab, mission-oriented agencies like Department of Atomic Energy, universities, depending on their mandate. But always remember, wherever you are, to remember the advice of Peter Medawar, who was a great biologist, Nobel Prize winner, whose work on immune system is considered world class. He said in his advice to young scientists that they should always work on important problems, important to science or important to society. Of course, it's a good advice for not so young scientists and non 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 scientists. Next. Next. See India for dreams, particularly young people like you. We want an India which is economically developed. Of course, the United Nations came out with the 17 sustainable development goals. I'll show a slide in a moment. But that's only the beginning. No poverty, no hunger. That's the beginning for us. We want to become a developed country. We want to have an India where the human development index is high. Among the top 10, we must be scientifically advanced. Excellence in basic research, excellence in applied research, but also excellence in what I call directed basic research. Still basic research, but directed towards India's needs in the long term. It's not to be confused with applied research. You want excellence in technology development, R&D led innovation. And all of this, if this to create value, it has to be backed by high quality manufacturing skills. And we should use technology foresight to select the critical technologies for India development. I'll show you a slide on that a little later. And we want to be militarily strong. With the ability to fight and win conventional wars, crush perpetrators of low intensity conflicts, terrorists, and then, you know, I always said, start night of my lecture, I said a couple of years back, that national development and national security are two sides of the same coin. Development without security is vulnerable. Security without development is, of course, meaningless. And in history, there are examples of that. Very well developed because of national, lack of national security, uh, they got defeated in war. You can have a very high security, no development, and the countries, became, they, the people became, the people became impatient. Next time. The Human Development Index, uh, uh, I talked to you about, and uh, said for, you know, United Nations defines it in terms of three parameters. Per capita GNP, life expectancy at birth, and adult literacy. 
Oh, they changed that to literary index more recently. But I've always said 20, 30, 20 years I've been saying it can be better defined in the case of developing countries in terms of two parameters, per capita electricity consumption. So per capita electricity consumption is obviously monotonically related to per capita GDP. More the energy, electricity you put in, more is the gross national product. I've also shown, I won't go into this, that life expectancy at birth also depends on per capita electricity consumption because you get good primary health and even secondary tertiary health, you have got electricity available. The second parameter I mentioned was female literacy. I, I chose female literacy, the health literacy, but that it's a measure not only of literacy, but of equity and justice in that society. In areas like Kerala, for instance, there is very little difference between male and female literacy, very high, both are very high. But in parts of Eastern UP, in parts of Odisha, in other places, where the per capita electricity assumption, the growth is low, the lower the average literacy, the higher is the difference between male and female literacy. But the good news is that Everything is going up in India quite rapidly now. And I've shown obviously, it's very obvious, that the birth rate, birth rate and infant mortality depend very strongly and inversely on female literacy. Of course, that's only the beginning. India cannot become a developed country unless it reaches near 100% literacy levels without gender discrimination. Female literacy is of course only the beginning then on to education and higher education like Indra Gandhi Delhi Technical University for Women. Out of sustainable development goals also apart from no hunger, no poverty and all that, there is a goal called gender equity. Gender equality, many women, leading women achievers prefer the word gender equity to gender equality. India is uh, going purposefully in that direction. You know, Dr. Pratiba Jolly, Professor Pratiba Jolly who was the principal of Miranda House, she's actually a physicist but also a leading educationist. She was a member of the International Union Panel on Physics Education. She and a couple of her colleagues wrote a recent article and, and, in the Canada, and in that they say, and I quote, the 17 leading co-educational colleges which, have, which are there, the NIR of 2021 ranking, five in the top 10 are female led. Oh, there are women who are high achievers in India, the former secretary DBT, present secretary Banju Sharma, present DBT secretary Enu Swaroop, the, the secretary in, in the, my office, PSA's office when I was there, Dr. Swati Basu, she was being the director of the medium range weather forecasting center before that. Dr. Tessie Thomas is the leading missile technologies in DRDO. You know, there is an excellent book many of you might have seen, Leela Vatish Daughters about Women scientists in India. A collection of fascinating essays, autobiographical and biographical. That's why you sometimes they overcome so many difficulties to get to the top. Globally, there are many women scientists who won the Nobel Award. Irene Jolio Curie, Dorothy Hodgkin, for example. Jolio Curie's mother, Mary Curie, was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. First person and the only woman to win the Nobel Prize twice in different subjects, physics and chemistry. These are the 17 sustainable development goals defined by the United Nations. And you know, if you look at SDG 7, affordable and clean energy. Number 13, climate action. And I said, 
that per capita electricity consumption is a measure of development. Electricity, of course, is the most convenient form of energy. And that has to be produced. Methods of producing it have to be clean, affordable, and clean. Otherwise, there is a question, and I will come short to you in a moment because of this uh, climate change. It's a very serious threat to civilization. Next slide. Climate change. You know, according to the International Panel on Climate Change, quick assessment report, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. Atmosphere and ocean are warmed by about a degree after the start of the Industrial Revolution in the late 19th century. Amounts of snow and ice have melted. Hindukush glaciers are melting. And the key measures to achieve this mitigation goals, you want to mitigate it, you must go for renewable energy, nuclear, carbon capture and storage. Of course, the forests are the best methods of carbon capture. Take in carbon dioxide and give you oxygen. In the latest report, which has come more recently, IPCC, they have now started recommending 1.5 degrees rather than the earlier target of 2 degrees. Out of 2, 1 degree is gone already. Same thing with the Paris Agreement and uh, as a result of which uh, we had this uh, huge program, very strong program on renewable energy started by the Prime Minister Modi in India. Just yesterday, the Nobel Prize in Physics was announced and that has been given and for groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of complex system. Complex system is a very interesting field in physics. Out of this, one half has gone to Shikuro Manabe and Klaus Hazelman for the physical modeling of Earth's climate, quantifying variability and reliability predicting global warming. Of course, other things are more directly related to complex systems. You must also remember that India, even those pursuing a low carbon energy technology, we are not a large GHG emitter. I have always said greenhouse gas emissions should be counted per capita. Anything in India because of our good population, very high 1.3 billion population, looks high. Our per capita greenhouse gas emission is only one tenth of the, that of the US. When I used to lead the Indian delegation, I used to point this out in those meetings that you are not a big emitter. You must look only at per capita. Suppose you are a tiny country. Nobody notices what you are emitting, but you may be emitting 20 times what India is emitting. Nuclear energy is recommended by the International Panel on Climate Change. We had a visit from the Director General of uh, IAEA in 2013 and he has com complimented India on that our development, remarkable success, is an inspiration for many developing countries and also appreciate a willingness to help other countries, which we are doing through the International Atomic Energy Agency. And he concluded by saying India is the forefront of technology development in the nuclear sector, not least in the area of fast reactors and related fuel cycles. He was referring to the Indian three stage program. First stage, prestige heavy water reactors using natural uranium. Take the plutonium from that and go to fast breeder reactors, which are breeder reactors. First one is coming up in Kalpakum, in, 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 in Kalpakum. And irradiate thorium there. Thorium is not fissile, but you have plenty of thorium. Yeah, thorium can be, thorium-232 gets converted to uranium-232. That will be our final cycle. And we go to thorium-232, uranium-233 cycle. But there is also an emerging interest, small and modular reactors, 
which can be mass manufactured and whether it is India or abroad it's likely that private sector will be more interested in this because the capital which tied up is on the small side. You know you must always remember safety and reliability go together. Whether it's your personal car or your refrigerator, something is working, some equipment. Your car is working well, clutch gives you no problem, brake gives you no problem. Very unlikely you will get into an accident. Same thing with the nuclear reactor. If it is reliable and reliability is measured by how long can it go on without repairs. On, in December 2018, the indigenously built unit 1 of Kaiga, Karnataka, Russia water reactor, broke the world record for continuous operation, 941 days since May 2016. That's what I remember. Our safety levels are very high, nuclear reactor operation, because the reliability is very high. But yeah, of course, if the operators some then we have a maintenance shutdown. And we also take care of the environment. Next slide, please. If you go to any of the power reactors, this is the reactors around Kaiga, which I mentioned just now. Plenty of greenery. Of course, in the site which we built, we may have to cut trees. But this culture of DAE, Department of Atomic Energy, and the Nuclear Power Corporation, is for every tree we cut, we plant 10 trees of the same genre, in the same area. That's why you are most welcome to visit one of these plants, this greenery, you can watch over here. Next slide. And if the environment is good, birds and butterflies come there. And in Kalpakam, Kalpakam has both research reactor and power reactors, Kalpakam and Tamil Nadu. And see all these beautiful birds which come there throughout the year. Next slide. Nuclear is of course its power, but nuclear is beyond that. In fact, I will challenge somebody to tell me one field of activity in which nuclear does not come in some way or other. We are able to export a bunch of mangoes to US because by nuclear irradiation you can prolong the shelf life and it can go by ship. By irrigating seeds, you produce new varieties with higher productivity, higher pest resistance, and also after make it sure the, the genetic variation is robust. That's a, in fact, many of our plants have come because we get radiation from high heavens, cosmic rays, and then it is released for use. Fifty such varieties are there, which are of various kinds. And of course for health, if you have a thyroid problem, drink a glass of water containing radioactive iodine. Harmless to you. Picked up by the thyroid. And then you can take a scan. Technetium, you can inhale. You can take a lung scan. Cancer cells, you can kill by radiation. What you see is the equipment, the small is Babatron. This uh, uses gamma rays to kill cancer cells, and you can control it. And you've got a program. Next slide. See, there is a beautiful writer. Some of you, are, I have read in Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He introduced a phrase called "black swan." His best seller, "black swan." Black swan is an unexpected event with serious consequences. Same author, later, he introduced the word anti-fragile. Fragile are things that break down under stress. Robust are things with which stand stress. And he defines a new word anti-fragile. Gets better and better. Not only does it resist shock, but like, uh, like you know, uh, Antibiotic resistant bacteria. They are anti fragile. And I have said, our this nuclear program is also true of that. We had technology denied, denied because of our nuclear test. Many things are refused to us. 
But then nothing happened. We made ourselves as even as director bar. I defined we became self-reliant. Not that you want to do everything yourself. Self-reliance, immunity against technology denial. Once you become stronger, others come to you. That is why once we became independent, we could do everything ourselves. Then the nuclear supply guidelines are relaxed. It's a special case for an NPT, non-signatory. And as I said before, we should learn more and more to leverage international cooperation to strengthen our own initiative. India, India is only a couple of countries in the world where the nuclear program is very vibrant, whereas it's gone down in some countries. But I'm sure if they are serious about climate change, sooner or later they have to come back to nuclear. And in fact, I told my Western friends many years back, we need you in the short term. You are going to need us in the long term. Because the founder of the program, Homi Baba, who died tragically in an air crash at the age of 56. Of course, every department missed him. But the program continued because he had created leadership swarm around him. Homi Setna, Chemical Engineering, Raja Ramana Physics, Brahm Prakash Metallurgy, A.S. Rao Electronics and so on. And uh, it was and continue to nucleate so many more leaders in the following generation. Now Arthur Kostler talks about two kinds of leaders, the yogi and the commissar. The yogi is the contemplative thinker, commissar is a man of action. Usually in organization you will find both kinds of leaders. But Homi Baba is a unique mixture of both. Great technology foresight. Thinking of India building nuclear reactors at the time were not even building bicycles. That was this not only confidence in himself, but confidence in his uh, countrymen. See, this is how, of course, uh, I talked about nuclear power, other dimensions of uh, nuclear, but nuclear weapon is also an important dimension. Dr. Rajaramana was the father of the Indian nuclear explosive program. He brought me into it in 1969. He called the first one, May 74, test a peaceful nuclear explosion. Of course, it is a physics wise, there is no difference. Only the packaging is different from that of a nuclear weapon. Of course, many people opposed it, saying it will damage the economy, sanction, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Same thing when we started in 98. 98 People started, no, there will be sanctions and nothing happened. In fact, our foreign exchange, if you, some of your economics professor can plot the foreign exchange reserves of India. As one economist told me, after 98, it started rising exponentially, far from hurting the economy. Of course, we have published uh, the paper, Sanctuary Protest, in a meeting, Raja Ramana and myself, in the after 74, we kept the nuclear option open, but then, thank God, Prime Minister Vajpayee came and we could carry out the 98 test. Next slide. So, there is a lot of science. There were a number of course, not one technology, nuclear explosion technology. We also had the help of Terminal Ballistics Research Lab, BRDO Lab in Chandir, where they are very good at handling chemical explosives because that is the starting point for creating the implosion and everything you take, every aspect of it, you have watched some of the world's leading experts in bark. That is why, and we knew we may not have get another chance, so we tested out the entire range of weapons, fission, booster fission and two-state thermonuclear. We had to control the yield of the thermonuclear device. Because the shaft had been done a decade earlier. At that time we were thinking of testing a booster fission device. The maximum yield, because you know, beyond the yield there is venting of radioactivity. 45 was the maximum, but there is no problem at all as I mentioned in this paper I wrote in the UK journal in 2008. No problem in going from low yield to 200 kilograms. 
course, they realized that we didn't. Uh, everybody realized this. Nobody helped us. Of course, we didn't need any help. Not did we do any spying or stealing knowledge, as many countries have done. This is the Venn diagram, historical sharing of nuclear weapons knowledge, published by a couple of American authors soon after our 98 test. And two, two circles interest of their sharing of knowledge one way or another. U.S. gave it to France, France to Israel, Israel to South Africa, Russia to China, China to Pakistan. And you see my good old India stands alone. See, India did not have any collaboration with anybody in developing nuclear weapons. Next slide. Of course, we have got uh, so many other departments who are doing extremely well. ISRO, we are proud of their achievements. And uh, in their 100 satellite, they successfully sent satellite. They do it also on a commercial basis. They sent satellites from 25 countries. Chandrayaan 2, except for the rover, which was a beautiful, spectacular project, the one, the satellite is circling the moon and sending them data. They are planning a manned flight mission. Uh, sometime next year. Next slide. Same thing with DRDU. Missile program is one of the very successful program in which Dr. Bill Kalam was involved. But you take another one, the LCA, light combat aircraft. You see how many technologies are involved here. Engine, electronics, configuration, advanced materials. And uh, this fighter pages has already been introduced in Indian Air Force. Next slide. Today, all advanced technologies are multi, multi-disciplined. A great design a nuclear power plant, or space launch vehicles, or advanced fighter aircraft, or a nuclear weapon project. They are all examples of multidisciplinary projects within an institution. Very often, it's not available here. We had started from my office when I was there. Gum had uh, given us 1,500 crores for this R&D project on advanced ultra supercritical thermal plant, coal based plant. But for the same power, it emits less carbon dioxide because you have taken the steam up to 700 degrees centigrade and above. This kind, even though NTPC builds plants, BHL makes equipment. Material is a big problem, so we brought in the Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research and we actually put the director of IG Card Chetal as the head of this project. And earlier this year, this project has been completed. World over, giant science and technology projects no longer possible for one country, multiple countries are involved. And India has many of them as an equal partner. We supply equipment to them. Large Hadron Collider, all the 1,800 superconducting sextopole magnets were supplied by India. Or you take this International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, ITER. ITER is a fusion reactor. You know, just like uh, E is equal to MC squared is used when a uranium nucleus breaks up on the sending in of a neutron into it, there is a mass deficit. That mass deficit converted into energy is equal to mc square. Same way, if light isotopes of hydrogen fuse together, there is a mass deficit and you get energy. But only since they are charged particles, they don't like to come near each other. You have to raise the temperature to 50, 100 million degrees before you get a significant fusion cross section. You have to create a plasma, contain them in magnetic fields. Going on in France, Carras, scheduled to start in 1925. And the seven main countries which are collaborating, European Union, Japan, China, India, India, South Korea and the United States. And we supplied this cryostat to them. This is the world's largest cryostat built by Larson and Tubro, designed by the Institute of Plasma Research in Ahmedabad which is a DAE institution. 30 meters in diameter, 30 meters in height. Into which the entire tokamak, tokamak is a Russian design, 
system, donut shaped system for high temperature plasma containment. And the base of this is already installed last year in, in Khadras. Of course, fusion science, I have said in my inaugural talk in a couple of years back, is a physicist's delight, but it's a huge, huge challenge for engineers. Next time. See, as I said before, India's technology needs range from nuclear to rural, and uh, we had started, when I started in 2004, Rural Technology Action Group, which is centered in seven IITs, but we make use of other organizations, in this case, VRC. This is to recharge aquifers in Uttarakhand. See, they build this, what they call the car on top of the hill. But they don't know whether the water from the pond, collected water, will go, go to useful aquifers or will be run off to useless places. So this uh, ratio of environmentally stable isotopes, 180, 18 oxygen or 16 oxygen ratio, heavy hydrogen, novel hydrogen, environmentally present radioactive tritium. The BRC scientists told them what is trying to flow this way. You put your subsurface dikes, which you see as white walls in the left picture, then the water will flow the way it evolved. And sure enough, you see the the one on the right is near a village, this new spring appeared subsequently. This technique of uh, just done in collaboration with HESCO, Himalayan Environmental Studies and Conservation Organization in Uttarakhand, led by my friend Anil Joshi. And this has now been multiplied in many places. Next one. You know, there is a technique in uh, knowledge transfer which these Harvard people, Sutton and, and Hargadon, call it knowledge brokering. So what they say is the best innovators. Use old ideas as the raw materials for one new idea after another. We call that strategy knowledge brokering. Well, I did some knowledge brokering myself. I saw that bridges were designed by a DRDO lab in Pune. And uh, when they enter enemy territory and there is a obstruction, either a natural ravine or cause an explosive crater, they can erect these bridges from one end, very light bridges. Army Jawan can carry it. But I said, why don't you build it in Uttarakhand? That time Uttarakhand floods had taken place. But this is even, there are plenty of natural ravines. And the women are affected the most because they carry backpacks. And then they go on to the ravine. When the water is there, they don't even know where they're putting their foot. And uh, the least that can happen to them is their ankle can get sprained. But in one case, a couple of young women are washed away in one of the ravines. So we built this in Bagi, a village uh, north of Uttarkashi. I went to inaugurate it there and we have called it the Women's Bridge. And this again, many people have, have done, have been built in Uttarakhand and maybe other next time. See, we need communication. Like you are Noah Harari says in his bestseller, humans are leading in the planet only because they know how to communicate. Language, then telephone, and now fiber communication. You can send huge data, and that's why we have the National Knowledge Network. I'm sure Indira Gandhi University has this uh, NKN connection. 1,600 institutions are connected to one another through this NKN, as it is called, led by RS Mani in uh, National Informatic Center of MITE. We are also connected to European Union grid and interview. And this is extremely important now for research collaboration whether doing it within the country or outside the country. Can I have the next slide? And of course, as I said, technology foresight is not just forecasting, 
you must find out depending on assessment of your resources your needs whether you want it or not you can develop a critical technology for india and for all these are important to us nanotechnology nuclear space advanced material but also import cyber security artificial intelligence supercomputers including quantum computers of course you have to review it periodically otherwise you can go wrong you can miss a recent discovery next one see supercomputers there is a supercomputing mission in india but indigenously built supercomputers are built by vrs it has gone to know two petaflops peak performance petaflop is a 1000 teraflop teraflop is a 1000 gigaflops gigaflop is a 1000 megaflops next cyber security now we have many institutions working on cyber security and pro sex is part of the pcs office i had started sex working on all these area agentry and machine learning because these are also needed cyber security is everywhere now from commerce to cyber security of course the hackers are also getting more smart and you have can they are also begin to use artificial intelligence to attack system and they have done also what we call a supply chain attack now next slide artificial intelligence and uh, some people are afraid that artificial intelligence Stephen Hawking great astrophysics guy the development of full artificial intelligence fell the end of the human race i don't agree i agree more with roger penrose who says that humans will always be smarter than computers and computer algorithms and any other cybernetic machines that they create and i agree look at this review of shrinivas ramanujan's great the greatest mathematician india has produced genius is a kind of from hebrew university on the book the man who knew infinity no enhancement of human intelligence opens a door to become a ramanujan and no algorithm is likely to produce robots with the abilities of uh, ramanujan next slide see finally boys you are a technical institution technology is power this is how i paraphrase alvin toffler's famous statement yesterday violence was power today wealth is power tomorrow knowledge will be power. all of them are related to technology so i say technology is power that is why countries and companies try to dominate technology two methods intellectual property rights technology control region we should do the same thing must not be we must have the ambition to be the first introducer of new advanced technologies only followers chase proven technologies and proven technologies i say are often a synonym for obsolete technology of course you have to be careful you have to take study it properly evaluate it properly look at the security and then last slide you you must have an appetite for risk taking now the beautiful book by john brockman this idea is brilliant and phil rosenweiss says when it comes to technological breakthroughs or launching new products it is better to act and fail than fail to act from sir abhijit banerji Nobel laureate in economics recently, 2019. I heard him talk, and in his lecture he says, "Title of the slide was risk and poverty trap. Poor people take up low risk, low return projects because they fear the risk, and so they remain poor. Same is true for research and innovation. If you want to do advanced research, want to go for breakthrough innovations, you must take." and with this i close my talk thank you very much jai hind very well said sir this was really informative session now let's switch to to the question answer part yes 
Yes, so the question is, as we all know that after receiving doctorate in physics, you joined BARC. So can you please enlighten us with your experience there? You see, I was working on hydrogen bonding. You know, hydrogen bond interaction is uh, an interaction somewhere between a covalent bond and Van der Waals interaction, hydrogen bond. And the advantage is a hydrogen bond is not as strong and directional as a covalent bond. It's not as weak and non-directional as a Van der Waals interaction. So, hydrogen bond is a very flexible interaction. That is why you see it so much in biological and organic uh, organic molecules, hydrogen bond. And I was fascinated by the structure of ice. And that is where I postulated the model of bent hydrogen bonds in ice. I won't go into that. And then, you know, the, and I used, the, I did the study using nuclear magnetic resonance. That gives you indirect evidence. But if you want direct evidence, you have to do neutron scattering. And they just then started their own indigenous reactor. That was the Dhruva reactor. And they were looking for somebody who would start a program on neutron crystallography. That is why I joined BRC in 1962. That is, uh, of course, then I studied in amino acids, which are the building of protein. And then Ramana called me into nuclear weapons. And then high pressure physics is the, was the mystic lane. And that's the uh, equation of state. How materials behave under high pressure. And along with the nuclear weapons work, I started a parallel program on high pressure physics. Of course, it became one of the leading groups in the world in that area also. Yes. Okay, sir. So the next question is, what will inspire you to go in the research field after completing your BSc? No, actually completed BSc honors in the Presidency College, Madras, now called uh, now called China. I was always interested in physics. That's why I went there and uh, the PSC honors in physics. Incidentally, it so happens. I heard my lectures in the same room in which C. V. Raman and S. Chandrasekhar had heard their lectures. But even without that, I wanted to do research. That's why I joined the Indian Institute of Science. Indian Institute of Science. By the way, uh, coming back to the older, earlier question, now I was talking of 62 when I joined, but in 1957 they started this BRC training school, and every year they take uh, take take people after an interview in uh, science, physics, chemistry, environmental science, engineering, and all that. So, if you want any of our young ladies want to join. But that is a quick route. Otherwise, you complete your education elsewhere like I did and you can do a horizontal entry. Now, that was, I'm adding to my first question answer now on my second. But I was always interested in research. And, 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 and you know, it was very fortunate circumstance that I have been in some of the best educational institutions. Presidency College, Madras. Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and then Baba Atomic Research Center, where I have been since then. You see the board behind my back, I'm, I'm a professor yes. here, I'm still there. I, I'm talking to you from BRC. Okay, sir. So surely uh, many young ladies and men will join the program that you said yeah. earlier for the question. And now the next question. How can we as students contribute to the nation's development? See, the first thing is, it is your responsibility to maximize your talents. It is your responsibility. Of course, the parents can advise you. The teachers can help you. Many of the great scientists have said it was the teacher who identified their talent or giftedness. By the way, that is also a responsibility of the teacher. Among the children, many of them are 
shy. Not only the girls, the boys are also shy boys. They may not know that they are talented somewhere. Then they help them to develop for that. Then always pursue a career in that area which fascinates you. Of course, you must look for careers which pay you reasonably, but money should not be your primary. Maximizing your talent would be your primary. But whatever, whatever profession, profession uh, you take. You know, Swami Vivekananda was once asked. Of course, he was a you know all know Swami uh, Vivekananda, and he said the old theology was, you are an atheist if you don't believe in God. Hundred years back, the great man said, today he is an atheist or she is an atheist who doesn't believe in. Himself or herself, self-belief. That is an important thing. Always have belief in yourself. Like Baba had, I told you. How can anybody have that foresight to think of India building nuclear reactors when we are not even building bicycles of indigenous design? Third, have optimism. Optimism. I have a passion for risk taking. Take it. When you choose a career, looks risky. Of course, you do due diligence study. Of course, risk taking you need everywhere in life, particularly in selecting of technology. You are a technical university, and you take a choice. Go choose all these techniques. Now even AI techniques are available. You can use them, but then, as I said, conclude rather, you must have a passion to do great things for yourself and for your country. Yes, Shahid, well said. So the next question is. So, what challenges does India face in terms of sustainable development? See, this is, you saw those uh, 17 sustainable development goals. See, first one is no poverty, no, no poverty. That is the ultimate goal. All of us, every technology, every activity, will tend to create wealth, equitable wealth. Then there will be no power. Not only should wealth be created, but wealth has to be shared. Then you come to no power, no hunger. If you are not poor, hopefully you are not hungry. So that is the primary, uh, primary. Then you go to affordable health care. That's why the most noble profession is the medical profession. You know, Thali Baja Modi ji had said. When these people had done so much for not thali thali, so yes. that the sound is heard all over at a particular time, 5 p.m. or whatever they have. So we must. That is that is why they, there is no single challenge. There is a multiple challenge area. Affordable energy. All sources of energy are important for India. Energy, electricity production. But now we have to worry also about uh, about climate change. We must be present in all advanced technologies to be sustainably developed. All of them are related. You may say, "Arey, yar, what is cyber security got to do with this?" But cyber cyber security, what hack into your database and wreck everything? So that is an important artificial intelligence. What artificial intelligence? Let us concentrate on real intelligence. It's not saying real intelligence must not be fully used. This is a support system. Creates expert systems. For example, 2015 there were huge floods in Chennai, which properly handled should not have happened. No. So now we have helped to create an expert system to prevent, to make early flood forecasting. 
you see the artificial intelligence will help you to collect data analyze it much better of course we never replace human intelligence which i told you before so much meteorological data so much climate data so much data is coming land water flowing that is coming from satellites and the information has to be provided at the ward level so that people can be evacuated prediction must start predictions can change every hour you tell them it's likely to hit you know direction has changed landfall is going away somewhere else so everything which you can think of all of them india must be a leader india must be a leader and then learn to apply it to our own problems see you must build a technology superstructure but also remember the foundation for that is laid by basic research otherwise one day the structure will collapse the highest intellect in a country must be allowed to work on fundamental problems of their child take say viraman suppose i and uh, you take we form a committee to examine raman wants to study why sky is blue so we come to the conclusion sky has always been blue what is the big deal here we can't support this project because he studied light scattering he won the nobel prize for raman never question the highest intellects all this if we do and this is being done action is being taken at all levels and it's not a it's not a single challenge a multiple challenge multiple challenge we have to face before we can become a developed country and then a knowledge economy yes sir sir we have last question that is what are the career opportunities in the research field see there are plenty of uh, career opportunities if they are but they are in national labs national labs csr labs they are in drdo labs mission oriented agency atomic energy and space we also have got uh, attached institutions like afr this one plenty of opportunities now in the research field then you know the first thing is you decide what is your area of interest keep a little option there don't make it very narrow keep a little option there then you decide which are the best institutions in india you can even find it from the google now or by reading other sources of information what are the best institutions in india where this kind of research is going on and then keep yourself a little flexible because you may not be able to because you may like to go there but there may be no vacancy at that point of time so plenty of career opportunities are there because r and d is growing r and d will never stop growing so it will always grow and then when you have decided try to attend lectures sometimes webinar lectures in the field of your interest field of your interest if you get an opportunity try to meet scientists your professor can arrange it with a professor of who is working in the field of your interest sometimes they also have kind of internship you can go and spend a few even without somebody very bright they don't mind uh, we are we are see we got a lot of people coming from universities spend some in and make sure you work with the person whose work you like all these are you know there's so no simple cut if you go ahead and these are going to increase career opportunities in india and in research are only going to going to increase. Yes, sir. Very well said. Sir, that brings us to the end. Thank you so much for taking your time out for, of your Thank busy you. schedule, coming here Thank to you. share valuable knowledge with us. Thank you, sir. And thank, thank you so you. much, everyone, for being thank such a great audience. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to talk to you and then interact with you. I wish you all the best. Yeah, thank, you, you thank you, sir. Thank you so all much. All the best in your future career. Thank you. Thank you, sir.